The future of mankind has seen an end to scarcity and famine, and now even the weather is under man's dominion. However, this prosperity has come at a terrible price, as the last of Earth's forests have been relegated to deep space, manned and maintained by a mere handful of volunteers. When it is finally decided to destroy even these last precious scraps of Mother Nature, Freeman Lowell takes it upon himself to save a single forest by any means necessary. He kills his crewmates, takes control of the Freighter Valley Forge, and goes into silent running, hoping to escape those who would eliminate that which he has sworn to protect. Alone and lost in the darkness beyond Jupiter, Lowell must make do with his android companions, even as the last precious vestiges of Earth's natural beauty start to succumb to an unknown ailment. Before we really get started, if you could do me an enormous favor and hit that like button and subscribe to the channel, I would be grateful to the ends of the earth. The YouTube algorithm is brutally efficient in what it chooses to preserve and what it chooses to destroy, so thank you in advance. With that obligatory begging out of the way, let's get back to the subject at hand. Environmental conservationism has been a major part of American culture since at least the early days of the Industrial Revolution, with figures such as Henry David Thoreau, John Muir, and Theodore Roosevelt championing the goals of maintaining and respecting the natural wonders of the American countryside well into the 20th century. It wasn't until 1970, however, that the modern conservationist movement began in earnest when President Nixon created the Environmental Protection Agency. Not everybody was on board with the aims of the movement, and conservation remains a subject of fierce sociopolitical debate to this day. Science fiction of the 1970s became, as a result, quite concerned about matters of nature and the environment, with many landmark works emerging from writers like Ray Bradbury and Frank Herbert. With Ursula Le Guin's The Word for World is Forest, serving as perhaps the best the fledgling subgenre of eco-fiction had to offer. This also became a staple of sci-fi cinema around the same time, and though Soylent Green may be the most well-known example from the era, it was preceded by Douglas Trumbull's equally important Silent Running. Trumbull, when he was in his early to mid-twenties, was one of the men responsible for the visual effects on Stanley Kubrick's 2001 A Space Odyssey, and he successfully parlayed that experience into a career in Hollywood, forming his own effects company that was hired to work on Robert Wise's The Andromeda Strain. Even though the Andromeda strain nearly bankrupted him because he severely underbid to get the job, it bolstered his reputation enough for Universal Studios to hire him as a director for his own film. Due to the unexpected success of the independently produced Easy Writer, many studios, including Universal, were willing to take gambles on smaller productions with untested directors and take a hands-off approach, foregoing the studio interference that is the norm for Hollywood. This is how Douglas Trumbull, a visual effects man with no directorial experience, was able to craft his own vision for his own film without the studio getting in the way. Trumbull had a treatment for a science fiction film called Silent Running, and the studio agreed to let him make it on a maximum budget of $1 million, though the final film did eventually rise to $1.3 million. This was a tiny budget for the story Trumbull wanted to tell, made even tighter by the 32-day shooting schedule, but he and his crew found ways to make it work. Trumbull had the treatment punched up and adapted into a full screenplay by Derek Washburn, Michael Cimino, and Stephen Bochco, and for the lead role, he hired actor Bruce Dern, a hard-working character actor known at the time for playing minor, usually villainous roles in films like Marnie, The War Wagon, and Hang 'em High, along with a seemingly endless string of guest appearances on television. As Bruce Dern spends the vast majority of the story playing the only human in the entire film, he had significant challenges to overcome, and to this day he considers Silent Running one of his best, most rewarding, and most emotionally draining acting experiences. The entire film is set inside a spacecraft, and rather than build sets from scratch, they remodeled areas inside the decommissioned and soon-to-be disassembled aircraft carrier, the real-life Valley Forge. There were a lot of tight, confined spaces, not very accommodating for a film crew, but it was a cheap and effective way to capture the claustrophobia of space travel. For the interior of the forest domes, which Trumbull based on the Climatron at the Missouri Botanical Gardens in St. Louis, they filmed at an airport hangar in Van Nuys that was less than 100 feet across. The exterior of the fictional Valley Forge was designed to look like the Expo Tower in Osaka. These effect shots, which are incredible for the time even without considering the tiny budget, were all done in camera, with liberal use of handcrafted miniatures and front projection techniques. But by far the most memorable effects in the film center on the three drones that serve as Lowell's companions for most of the story. Trumbull wanted to achieve an uncanny effect, to blur the line between robot and human in such a way that the drones would clearly look robotic, but also move with unmistakably human deliberateness. It works, too, and it's really hard to figure out how he achieved this task until you know the simple trick he used namely, bilateral amputees as actors. 
The drones represent the humanization of technology, and it's hard not to find them endearing. They were also a major source of inspiration for George Lucas. When Trumbull ultimately had to pass up on the opportunity to work on Star Wars, Lucas asked him if he could borrow the idea of the drones for his droids. And so Trumbull likes to say that, if it weren't for silent running, there would be no R2-D2. For the music, Trumbull hired Peter Shickley, a well-respected composer who led a double life as the screwball comedy act P.D.Q. Bach. Shickley had worked with famous folk pop singer Joan Baez a few times, and was keen to bring her on to sing a couple of songs he wrote for the film. Despite ducking calls from Shickley and Trumbull due to an exhaustive work schedule, and not having enough time to even read the script, Baez eventually agreed, lending her unique voice for two songs that play throughout the film. Hers was probably the most famous name in the entire production. Silent Running released in March of 1972 to a fair amount of critical success, with the effects and acting earning almost unanimous praise. Unfortunately, due to a complete lack of marketing and a very limited release schedule, Silent Running bombed at the box office. Exact numbers are hard to come by, but it reportedly didn't come anywhere near to clearing its million-dollar budget. Still, that didn't stall Trumbull's career, though he would only go on to direct one other film, 1983's Brainstorm, which had crazy behind-the-scenes drama that could make for a fun video in the future, he would continue to be a big name in visual effects, doing much lauded work on landmark films like Steven Spielberg's Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Ridley Scott's Blade Runner, and Terrence Malick's The Tree of Life. He has also been a long-standing champion of high frame rate techniques like those used by Peter Jackson and James Cameron, and he's done work for theme park rides like the Back to the Future ride at Universal Studios and the rides at Las Vegas' Luxor Hotel. For years, he has teased that he's working on a new science fiction film that is more ambitious than anything he's ever done before, but he's been talking about it since 2012 and hasn't given much in the way of details. Getting back to Silent Running, though, this is, at first blush, an overly earnest conservationist manifesto film. It sets itself up that way right at the start, with Lowell shouting about growing his own food and kids not knowing the beauty of a leaf in their hands. Then he goes out into the forest in his monk's robe to catch a falcon on his arm, and by the time Joan Baez starts crooning about fields of children running wild in the sun, it's an easy film to dismiss. The first time I saw Silent Running, far longer ago than I care to admit, I actually hated it for precisely this reason. It's not that I take issue with conservationism, far from it. I was raised with a healthy respect and love for nature. It's just that any message, when delivered with a sledgehammer, can become terribly off-putting, and that's what I initially thought this film was doing. Stylistically, it's also aged quite badly, with an aesthetic that is so 1970s it's embarrassing. However, Once you get over that saccharine first impression, Silent Running reveals itself to be more provocative and interesting than it first appears. According to Trumbull, the story wasn't initially conceived of as a conservationist morality tale. His first treatment was more of an alien invasion story, and his main focus was in forcing his hero to struggle alone in the wilderness of deep space with only robotic drones as his companions. He saw it as a kind of man lost in the woods with a couple of dogs kind of thing. The idea of Lowell being a forest ranger type who is trying to save what little is left of the natural world was more of a narrative device, a character choice given to motivate him into the silent running that was Trumbull's core concept. For Lowell, his moral compass is clear, as best expressed by the conservationist pledge he took when he agreed to the job. Saving the forest is more important than anything else, and this movie charts him sacrificing his companions, his sanity, and ultimately his life in service to that goal, a goal he appears to achieve. He commits murder, not because he thinks it's a moral thing to do, but because he is forced to make a choice between two immoral acts. His guilt over having to make such a choice is what threatens to drive him mad, and one of the reasons he ultimately chooses to commit suicide. If you assume the movie is trying to argue that this is the only morally correct set of actions he could have taken, then this would be a very uncomfortable story that takes its conservationist messaging far enough to justify eco-terrorism. However, I don't think that's what's going on here. Instead, I think this is an echo of Hal's dilemma from 2001, or at least the dilemma as it was explained in 2010, the madness that results from having to make a choice between two unacceptable evils. Indeed, Lowell's choice to murder his crewmates so disrupts the functioning of the ship that there is no conceivable way he could have survived his silent running. One analysis I came across online from John Kenneth Muir, which I'll link in the description, persuasively suggests that Lowell's actions destroy the ecosystem of the Valley Forge itself, that in an effort to save the ecosystem of the forest, he is forced to destroy an equally important and beautiful ecosystem created by his companions. Instead of assuming that this is a straightforward morality tale, then, this movie works far better when you assume moral neutrality, 
that this movie is neither justifying nor judging Lowell for his choices. Indeed, there's no glorification in his suicide, no final voiceover telling the audience how to feel about a man blowing himself up in order to cover up his crimes and keep the forest he saved from being discovered. In recent viewings, I've found this film to be far more careful and nuanced than I gave it credit for all those years ago, and now I think about it often, pondering the moral gray areas it so adeptly explores. Movies this daring and experimental are rare and should be celebrated, not relegated to obscure cult status. It's also an important stepping stone in sci-fi cinema, in an age where science fiction films were struggling to find a middle ground between the pulpy fantasies of the Golden Age and the stylized realism of the 70s. It owes its existence to 2001 A Space Odyssey, just as 1977's Star Wars owes its existence to Silent Running. They are three very different films, but the connective tissue between them is hard to miss. And that's all for today, my fellow Earthlings. If you haven't done so already, please give this video a like and subscribe to the channel. For more reviews of science fiction classics in both film and literature, check out my website at emcgill.com, where I've just finished up an entire summer exploring the works of Robert Heinlein. If you'd like to support the work I do even more, head on over to my Patreon, where you can get early access, vote on future videos, and much more. This video was one that my patrons had a hand in choosing. Until next time, this is The Unapologetic Geek, telling you to never be ashamed of what you love, as long as you're not hurting anybody. You think about that.